So good morning everyone. Thanks so much for coming to Cardiff Business School this morning. Delighted to welcome you all to the school and the university um, for our breakfast briefing this morning, Healthier Wales. So my name's Sarah Lethbridge. I'm the Director of Executive <coughs> Education here at the Business School and my job is to help access all of the wonderful research of our researchers and share that knowledge with the outside world. So if you've got any training needs, if you're interested in things like our um, Executive MBA, our Masters in Public Leadership, um, our part-time HRM programme, please come and see me. We've um, got a couple of events flagged. The next breakfast briefing is called What's So Special About South Wales? Um, and Robert Lloyd Griffiths and the IOD, Ken Paul, Head of Economic Development in Cardiff Council, and Bruton Knowles, Claire Taylor is going to talk about the region and all the changes that are happening um, and the opportunities that are happening for us in Cardiff. And then on the Tuesday, the 7th of January, we've got our professional programmes information evening. Cheese and wine will be served um, if anyone's interested in finding out about these part-time masters. There you go. In the executive <coughs> suite, just grab me, John or Hannah, if you want to register for that one. Just to note that our breakfast briefing will be recorded. We are being live streamed at the moment, um, but the audience should be featuring any of those filmings. And um, if you do ask a question, please wait for a microphone just so that our big, massive internet audience can um, hear what you've got to say. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Eva McDermott. She's a Professor of Human Resource Management here in the school, and she's going to be our academic chair for this event. Thanks ever so much, Eva. Good morning everyone, I'm delighted to be here this morning, um, in part because my chief role at the moment is as coordinator of our healthcare planning programme, so I'm delighted to welcome you and, and our delegates of that programme which launched yesterday here this morning. Um, this morning we're going to hear from two speakers which is a real treat, um, we're going to start uh, by hearing from Simon Dean, um, who's Deputy Chief Executive of NHS Wales, and he's going to talk about A Healthier Wales, our plan for health and social care. Um, Simon is perfectly positioned to talk about this. Um, he has over 30 years experience in the NHS and since 2004 has been with us here in NHS Wales. He's held a wide uh, variety of, of posts in that time, um, one of those as uh, the Director of Planning and Performance for Welsh Government and since then uh, he's served as Chief Executive of uh, Valindra um, NHS Trust and Interim Chief Exec of, of Betsy Cadwallader. Um, so we're uh, delighted to welcome him and uh, he has been Deputy Chief Executive uh, of NHS Wales since 2014. So Simon will speak for about 15 minutes and afterwards we're going to hear from Samia Saeed Edwards. Um, and Samia's current role is as NHS Planning Programme Director and, and she comes with a wealth of experience, 20 years this year, although she obviously doesn't look that. Um, and uh, she started as a general management trainee and has since worked in a range of planning roles. And I think it's really nice to hear those two perspectives together uh, and Samia will speak uh, for a similar amount of time and then we'll have time for questions uh, from the audience. So without uh, further ado, it gives me huge pleasure uh, to hand over to Simon. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, everybody. Uh, clearly, I do look my age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I have insights, which is... Uh, <laughs> Which I've always thought is a good uh, is a good place to start. Uh, can I begin with an apology uh, for keeping you waiting? Uh, I thought I was just on time. My diary said half past eight, but uh, Samir Kali rang me a few moments ago to politely ask where I was, uh, so I hurried along. So I do apologise for keeping you waiting, but thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to to join you. Samir and I work very closely together in in Welsh government, so we're going to do a double act and try and cover both a broad perspective and a slightly more detailed perspective on uh, healthier Wales and planning. Um, so we're going to talk about how the NHS is changing and needs to change to meet its obligations to the people of Wales and its staff in the 21st century. I'm going to talk about the strategic context, the big picture. I'm going to try to, to give a broad coverage of some of our engagement with partners. Uh, and then Samir will talk more about some of the practicalities which leads into the planning programme, which we're really excited to see is, is starting. I mean, we've got some of the first group of students in the audience. I'm sure you'll find it a really rewarding, interesting and helpful programme. 
and I'm sure that I'll have the opportunities to engage with students as the programme uh, develops. I'd like also to thank Cardiff Business School both for hosting the event this morning and for hosting the programme. So we're looking forward to that relationship developing over time. It's going to be of huge benefit to us and I hope it will be a benefit to the university as well. So people in Wales held the NHS very dear to their hearts. It was uh, an Iron Bevan after all was a local boy. Uh, had something to do I think with the founding of the NHS 70 plus years ago and there's a very strong legacy that, that is core to the values of Wales. Of course times have changed and we have to continue to, to strive to provide the best possible care to patients and citizens and to make sure that we are adapting to a changing world. We've chosen in Wales to, uh, to embrace a planned system rather than a commissioning or a market approach as followed in other parts of the United Kingdom. I worked for 21 years in the English NHS uh, before I joined NHS Wales at the beginning of 2004. So I've experienced both the Welsh system and the English system. Uh, there's a great opportunity think, to compare and contrast to draw the best from both systems. But what we're really keen to do in the Welsh system is to use quality and patient experience as the focus for the conversation, not money and contracting. Those things are important, they have a role to play because we have to make sure we're making best use of the huge amounts of public money that we spend. But we want to drive the conversation through a focus on people, needs, quality and outcomes rather than start with some of the debates that I'm very familiar with uh, over many years as a Director of Commissioning and a Chief Executive which is how much money have I got or how much money can I have because it changes, it sets up a dynamic to the conversation which we don't feel is particularly constructive or appropriately focused. So in 2016, uh, we took a decision to have a close look at how we were structuring the health and care system in Wales, really to, really to take stock and to help to provide advice to shape the next phase of the development of our system. That uh, was in part prompted by a review by the OECD the previous year, um, and led to a parliamentary review uh, which was undertaken in 2017, uh, which was set up by the Welsh Government. It was chaired by a former Chief Medical Officer for Wales, Dame Ruth Hussey. It drew together an invited panel of experts across the health and social care field from within Wales and internationally to provide advice uh, and to offer critical commentary and constructive commentary on how we should be developing our system. They published a report uh, in 2018, January 2018, which set out 10 recommendations. They focused on what was good within the Welsh system and what could be improved and what needed to be adapted to, to, uh, to adjust to a changing environment. Their conclusion was that, and I quote, Wales needs a different system of care, one that empowers individuals to take decisions, tailors care to the individual's expressed needs and preferences, is more proactive and preventative, is provided as close to people's homes, is seamless and is of the highest quality. So that was their overarching recommendation for the type of system we need to create to meet the needs of the world population. Underpinning this was the, the idea that, uh, about the quadruple aim, which sets four key strategic aims for the system, which are to improve population and health, uh, health and well-being through a focus on prevention to improve the experience and quality of care for individuals and families, to enrich well-being, capability and engagement of the health and social care workforce, and to increase the value achieved through funding of health and care through innovation, improvement, use of best practice and eliminating waste. And that's a really important objective to set out, both a focus on patients but also critically on staff. Health and care is a people business, it's all about how people are engaged, how people choose to work, how people are supported in what they do. So it's much more than organisational structures and business processes. We have to make sure we're looking after our staff, that we are developing, that we're offering opportunities to grow and enrich. Of course we do have to achieve value, we do have to make best use of the resources that we have. There is a lot to do in the system and we have to make some choices. And critically, we need to work upstream. We need to improve uh, healthy communities. We need to improve life chances. We need to reduce the need to intervene in the treatment of illness to the extent that we can. 
So if I can get the technology to work. There we go. That's the front cover of a healthy... I've only got four slides. Don't we see, it's not going to be death by, death by slides. So our response was to produce a healthy Wales, which was produced in June 2018. Ten-year plan for health and social care. Uh, so this is about where are we going and critically how are we going to get there. So it contains a large number of objectives that are at a very strategic level. The challenge now is to operationalise those, to turn those into deliverable plans and to really make them live in the real world. We're very fortunate in <coughs> Wales to be both small enough and big enough. We're small enough that we can get people together, that we can build effective relationships, that we can explore different perspectives. <coughs> we meet every month with all the chief executives from the NHS organisations in one room. That's not possible in the English system. You have a conference hall. The nature of the conversations is very different. We can get medical directors, directors of nursing, directors of social care, all <coughs> together to debate issues of common interest on which they will have different perspectives, which are in part driven by local circumstances. So we can build an approach that's based on relationships, underpinned by strong relationships where people know each other, can build trust, because these things are so important when it comes to some of the more tricky discussions of which there are undoubtedly some. So we have that opportunity to build a community approach uh, which is not, I don't present that as a soft notion, it's not, not that bad at all. It's about <coughs> developing a single mission, about getting people on board, about debating direction, about talking about key policy objectives and working those through our various structures. The First Minister and the Minister for Health and Social Services are both absolutely committed to, to uh, supporting people. This is absolutely central to everything <coughs> they say it's all about what are we doing to improve a lot of people in Wales, what are we doing to improve the experience for staff in our system. And our policy context and the Legislative Foundation, which I think Samir will talk a little bit more about later on, is really focused on that notion of supporting people, staff, patients and service users, and that's a critical part of the quadruplane. So we've set out the strategic goal in a Healthier Wales, that's our high level response to the <coughs> parliamentary review. Um, I guess the question then is, it's the so what question, how do we turn that into practical reality? It's having a, a document with 40 uh, actions is great, the challenge now is to turn those into change action over uh, an appropriate period of time. So critical to the approach, I'm sorry those are perhaps a little, a little difficult to read, we can provide copies of the slides um, outside the session if people would like them. Uh, critical is, is the, the need to move upstream, shift left is the, become the latest jargon phase, so the strong focus on moving away from the reliance on acute hospital care and a system in which that's the first part of the conversation into a system that's based on communities and primary care where that becomes the first part of the conversation. Within that, even further upstream, we want to be supporting individuals and communities to, to support their own health. That's, so there's something there about individual action. There's also something about how government policy and action helps to create healthy communities, helps to create the conditions in which people are able to maximise their opportunities for, for benefit. So the thrust of the vision set out in Healthy Wales is, is sixfold. So we want to achieve longer, healthier and happier lives. We need to focus on health and social care as a single system. That's an easy thing to say. There are some complications in that relationships, but it is absolutely critical. This is not, you know, health will not be approved, it will not be improved by the NHS acting on its own. This, there is a role in this for everybody, and I include academia, business, the third sector, local authorities as well as the NHS. We want to achieve equal health outcomes for all. We've all heard of the inverse care law. I'm afraid to say that is alive and well. You don't have to travel very far to find parts of Wales where the life experience and health outcomes experience is markedly different within relatively short travel distances. So there's a, a critical uh, objective there for us to focus on. We want to deliver care closer to home but we need to make that seamless care. We need, to make, we need to look at that care through the lens of the patient, the recipient, the citizen. Um, we can all think of examples, I'm sure I certainly can, of 
for example, my father, uh, who died earlier this year, age 96, you know, having multiple <coughs> visits from multiple people, dealing with aspects of his care, found it quite confusing, actually quite hard to understand quite what was going on, hard to join it up. So how do we change the way in which we respond to people in a way that makes sense to them? <coughs> Hospital only when needed. Hospitals will always be needed. Um, but do they need to do everything that they are currently doing? The answer to that, I think, is clearly no. A huge role for technology. Um, I'm, I'm a bit too old, personally, to, uh, to have a deep understanding of the technological agenda, but my kids operate in a very different way than I did when, when I was in my early 20s. So what are the opportunities that technology presents, and how do we take advantage of them, particularly given that they seem to move incredibly rapidly, whereas systems tend to change a bit more slowly? So how do we bring the benefits of technology closer to the home to help us to achieve those objectives. One of the ways, uh, which I've touched on a little bit earlier, is about bringing organisations together. So we have a number of mechanisms across Wales that bring organisations into the same room to talk about issues where they have a shared interest. One of them is public service boards, unique to Wales. They have a really important role in bringing together a wide range of stakeholders around a place-based <coughs> agenda. So that opportunity to think about services uh, and developments from the citizen point of view. Uh, so they can plan collectively, they can decide what each party is going to contribute and work with communities to drive improvement. One very specific thing that we have established uh, this year is the transformation programme. Uh, where we provided uh, for an initial three year period £100 million transition fund which is targeted to support the, the shift in the system so it's non-recurrent pump priming funding which is there to facilitate change so we're committing a further 192 million pounds in this year's 100 million pounds last year uh, and that's to help to drive forward the change in a very practical way we've rooted that through regional partnership boards which is another mechanism that brings together local authorities and healthcare. Uh, and we're using that to drive the development of seamless care and the, the clarity that we're, we're looking for is, is the transition phase because this money is there for a pump priming period of two years so we're interested in how that is going to shift the system, how it's going to enable system change rather than service change if I put it in that terms. This has to be about large scale change. We've uh, currently approved £89 million worth of spend, which is supporting 14 proposals and at least one in each of the regional partnership agenda. So there's work going on across Wales. There'll be a couple of examples of those, if I, if I may. So the Kumtawi cluster in Swansea Bay area is a programme of change which is strongly led by the primary care clusters, which is a mechanism within primary care that brings individual GP practices together to work in a collaborative way. It's aiming to support people with self-care, well-being and maximising community resources, including crucially the contribution from the third sector, which is huge. We have a, a pro project called a Healthier North, North Powys, which is transforming health, health and social care that's delivered in a rural setting, which doesn't have a district general hospital. So we have some quite different communities with quite different locally based resources available to them. The approach there is to implement local and regional hubs which streamline primary care alongside a strengthened community base whilst also developing and delivering on stock take of our workforce capabilities because we need a different type of approach to workforce development in uh, more rural parts of Wales. We're looking at, so they're looking at using client facing digital applications to, uh, to deliver care in a different way in a rural setting. In North Wales, uh, there's a comprehensive programme of change with a focus on children, people with learning disabilities, mental health and development of community-based integrated teams, spanning three broad geographic areas that are quite distinct in terms of socio-economic and cultural context. So we're trying things, we're seeking transformation, we're looking for learning to be shared across Wales, we're looking for things at work to be to, to translate into different contexts. And there are many other examples that I could uh, share across Wales. We've also undertaken two major reviews of the digital landscape in health and social care in Wales. 
And in response to those reviews, the Minister's investing £50 million to improve the use of digital and technological solutions uh, and developing principles such as open architecture and open standards. And if you're interested in understanding more of that, the Minister made a statement at the end of September which set out those priorities in, in greater detail. So that digital piece is incredibly important as we look to transform our services. We're also making solid links with partners in social care, the third sector, the independent sector, and with industry. So Wales is home to manufacturing sites for numerous global brands, GE, 3M, Norgene, BTG, Convitec, PCI, Siemens, Orthoclinical Diagnostics, and the list could go on, as well as a thriving medium and small business community which benefits from industry strengths in electronics and device and diagnostics manufacturing. So bringing NHS and social care needs together with industry and academia in a supportive political environment is driving a pipeline of projects with companies such as Pfizer, Siemens, Leica, IBM Watson and Zimmer Biomet. These companies are developing new innovative healthcare solutions and they can do that because in part of the supportive environment that we have within the Welsh context. They're developing value-based healthcare they're providing sustainable, high-value job opportunities in Wales, which is part of that broader approach that we need to be seeing. We spend over half, <coughs> that's the NHS healthcare, spends over half of the entire Welsh Government's budget. It's even more if you include social care funding as well. So we have a significant responsibility for how those resources are used. The NHS in Wales employs 80,000 people, it's a major employer. So we have huge opportunities through our workforce. We want to make sure that we're building on innovation. We're supporting that through organisations such as the Life Sciences Hub Wales and the recently launched Innovation Network for Health and Social Care. So the Life Sciences Hub Wales is funded by Welsh Government, supports partners in health and social care, industry and academia to identify and support new ways of working, new technologies that make a positive difference to the well-being of patients. There's three core objectives, so improving health and well-being outcomes for the people of Wales, improving efficiency and value within the Welsh healthcare system and driving economic development through business growth and good jobs. It delivers unique programmes that support, accelerate and drive innovative <coughs> healthcare, uh, health and care solutions from the life sciences industry. These include the Digital Health Eco Ecosystem Wales and the Accelerate programme to name but two. We're also supporting businesses through changes through, through for example, the Bevan Exemplar Health Educate Health Technology Exemplar programme and the efficiency through technology fund. So the Bevan Health Technology Exemplars are in their fifth cycle. They developed over fifty projects across a range of disciplines and backgrounds. And the independent evaluations of the first three cohorts evidenced a £5 investment from the healthcare technology participants for every £1 invested by Welsh Government. So there's a really important gearing benefit that we're seeing from those programmes. And the Health Technology and Exemplar programme allows NHS Wales staff to work in partnership with an industry partner to rapidly introduce, implement and evaluate an innovative health technology within a clinical pathway. And that has similar aims to the other programmes that I've described about improving the way in which the NHS works, about critically providing a mechanism to develop, accelerate and scale up innovation and to stimulate the social movement for change through encouraging people to take an interest in finding those innovative uh, activities to pursue. The final point I'll, I'll mention under this broad heading is the £6 million efficiency through technology programme which supports a range of projects across Wales, which support technological development, adoption and innovation. So targeted funding has been used under that programme to support the initial adoption and evaluation of new technologies and to support scaling up. So I hope you're seeing a consistent theme of seeking to build wide partnerships that draw uh, uh, the greatest possible range of interests <coughs> together and making progress across all fronts. I would like just to mention by enclosing the city deals, important uh, innovations that offer real opportunities 
for developing place-based programs that will benefit uh, the population of Wales. We have some experience developing and city deals in the Welsh context. Uh, and all of this work is supporting, if you like, the traditional core NHS activities of seeking to plan, develop services, with an increasing focus on engaging and working with individuals and communities in a very supportive environment for staff. And that brings me to the education programme which was launched today, which I'm not going to say a, lot of, a large amount of it because I know that Samir will be touching this. But I do want to stress the importance of this. In my view, planning has become a lost art. In a, in a commissioning system, different skills tend to come to the fore and I think we, we, we have to pay a lot of attention to rediscovering planning in its purest sense. And planning is not about writing documents. Planning is about shaping the future of systems and organisations and services. It's about identifying opportunities. It's about identifying challenges. It's about understanding population needs. It's about planning strategies that move towards it. And then it's about making focused and relentless progress through very specific steps towards those objectives. And always with the well-being of the population at its heart, always with a focus on addressing equality and inequality issues, always with a focus on equity, and within that, of course, with a focus on the best use of the resources available to us. Because the opportunity cost of not using our resources well is that missed opportunities to provide care. So, in closing, I hope that's been a helpful, very broad scan over a, a landscape. What I wanted to convey was that, that we, we, we don't sit there thinking only about the NHS. We try to think about the NHS within a context, and the context is critically important because the NHS will not be able to succeed if it takes a very insular view. So increasingly it is about building partnerships. It's about creating an environment in which organisations and interests can come together to address the broad challenges and um, to take advantage of the opportunities that we face in Wales. So thank you very much indeed. Right, um, good morning all and um, thank you Simon. I think Simon and I have been billed as a, a double act this morning. I've been trying to think of a dynamic male-female combo um, and I failed to think of any that were appropriate. I think the best that I could come up with were uh, Dempsey and Makepeace, so I'll leave you with that <laughs> thought uh, during, the, uh, during the course of the morning. Um, thank you also to Cardiff Business School, not just for hosting uh, this morning's breakfast briefing, but also for the work that they've done, undertaken, a huge amount of work over the last six months to bring the um, postgraduate diploma in healthcare planning uh, to life and that was launched yesterday. Um, I also very quickly wanted to thank Heather Giles as well who's worked behind the scenes um, on this morning's uh, breakfast briefing um, and has done all of the, the hard leg work on the planning programme for learning and she's the reason with Cardiff Business School that we're here today. Uh, my name's Samia Saeed Edmonds, I'm the NHS Planning Programme Director um, in Welsh Government and like any role I have a formal mode and an informal mode. Um, so the formal part of my, uh, my job is that I and my team develop um, annual guidance to the NHS um, on planning. Um, we also assess the 15 NHS mm. organisational plans that come in and we make uh, recommendations to the Minister on their approval. And for the first time this year, we developed a national plan as well. And I'll say a little bit more uh, about that in a moment. The informal bit, which is the bit that I really enjoy, is that we undertake engagement with uh, NHS organisations um, and wider partners to facilitate that environment uh, to make sure that planning is fit for purpose. Um, and most recently, we've launched the Planning Programme for Learning. It includes the postgraduate diploma. It's much broader than that. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, but I'm also uh, delighted uh, to be one of the first cohort of students as well. So I'm, I'm here today with uh, quite a few hats, um, but I think it demonstrates that there is always more to learn, particularly uh, in the planning environment. Um, so I'm going to talk for 15 minutes. I'm not going to say uh, too much. I'm not going to be too techy, but I am going to talk about the practicalities of NHS planning and how we keep an eye uh, to the wider public, uh, public service horizon as well. So I'll talk about integrated planning. I'll give a quick overview about the strategic context. 
I'll, I'll uh, reflect on what Simon said about the healthier whales and how we're translating that into plans uh, across NHS organisations. And I'll talk particularly about integrated medium-term plans, IMTPs, um, because they are the vehicle uh, for us in taking all of that forward. I'll reflect on our expectations for the next planning cycle um, and I'll say a little bit more about the planning uh, profession and throughout that I'll give some uh, both professional and also some uh, personal reflections <coughs> as well. Um, so as Eva said in, uh, in the introductions, 1999 was an incredibly important year because it was the year that I graced NHS Wales with, uh, with my presence um, and I, I joined as a, an NHS management trainee and um, uh, many of you will know that at that time, management trainees weren't just attached to organisations, they were attached to particular hospital buildings. Um, and I had a bit of a problem uh, with that, um, and I broke the mould a little because I wanted to spend time in hospital, but I also wanted to spend time in the community, in social services, and also uh, with the third sector. Um, so that disruptive behaviour of mine started very, very uh, early on. And then since then, I've uh, enjoyed a 20-year career in planning, planning on those boundaries across health, social care, um, and wider pl uh, public sector. But 1999 was an important year for, for another sort of more, more uh, serious reason, and that's because it was the year that we saw devolution um, in Wales. And since then, Wales has set out its own particular path, particularly within um, an integrated planning um, environment. And it has developed a unique suite of, of, of Welsh legislation, all of which focuses on the citizen, on people, and in which the communities they uh, and the communities in which they live. And that includes the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, and also the Public Health Wales Act. And I just wanted to dwell upon um, the wellbeing of, uh, of future generations, because I think that gives us an incredible opportunity in Wales. Um, many of you will know that it was derived from the United Nations Sustainability Goals, and Wales is the only country in the world to have placed that on a statutory footing. And that's true global leadership. And other countries, such as New Zealand, Canada and the Netherlands, are all looking to Wales to learn from, from that experience. It's a true opportunity for us to shape the Wales that we want. And from my perspective, what I'm really interested in is how we use planning um, through public service boards and other planning arrangements to explore the Caerphilly we want, the Cardiff we want, the Flintshire we want, and, and so on. So for me... Organize, uh, geographical narrative is hugely important. I think organisations need to understand their place in the community um, and the, uh, the geography in which they operate and to align their plans um, within that sphere. I think it's that geographical narrative that gives the public, staff and stakeholders something that they can invest in. It gives them a sense of place, identity and connection. So that's my, my sort of golden thread through which we work when we think about planning. That geographical narrative can be set by public service boards, but I think we all find it far too easy to stay at the centre, in the small bit at the mid, in the middle that's local, that's familiar to us and which is short term. So through our planning arrangements, we're pushing organisations and partnerships to think more broadly and to think longer term as well. I think there's also a particular challenge within that around involvement. I think um, the NHS has been quite traditional in its involvement um, and we're starting to think much more broadly using the, uh, the Wellbeing Act as a lens to think about um, how we in, um, involve community in a much more diverse way um, and to, to really get a sense of what the issues are for them. So integrated medium-term plans provide an opportunity and a vehicle to take all of that um, forward with a real focus on outcomes, quality, improvement and also uh, transformation. Now this is my techie bit, so I'm not, I'm not going to be too technical, I'll keep it fairly simple. Um, but it was just to stress that there is a statutory duty to develop integrated medium-term plans um, and that duty applies equally to um, health boards and NHS trusts. But I think it's also important to note that the national non-statutory organisations, uh, such as the Welsh Health um, Specialised um, Services Committee, um, the um, Emergency Ambulance Services Committee, Shared Services, and also the NHS Wales Informatics Service, choose to develop their own integrated medium-term plans. That's a commitment and a belief um, through, uh, demonstrated by them that this is a discipline uh, that is worth, um, uh, worth adopting. 
Now, it is a statutory duty, uh, but where organisations are unable to develop approved and balanced, um, uh, board approved and balanced <laughs> three-year plans, they will breach that duty um, and they are required uh, to develop annual plans. Um, and there are a series of escalation arrangements that sit around that. Um, at the moment, we have three of our NHS organisations um, who, who um, have annual plans uh, in place. And I think it's also worth noting that the, um, the integrated medium-term plans are approved by the, uh, the Minister for Health and Social Services. I don't think that that's a, a, a statutory sort of discipline that sits within any other uh, public service um, uh, sector at the moment. Very quickly, this is what we're looking for within our integrated plans. It's, just, it's, it's much more than planning as a process. We're looking for organisations um, to look internally and to look externally with their partners to think about how they improve population health outcomes, um, how they meet quality standards, uh, how they implement service change <coughs> where required, how they meet uh, performance requirements, and how they use their workforce, their infrastructure, such as capital and digital, and also uh, within a financial envelope um, to, to improve, uh, to loop back around and improve population uh, health outcomes. So if I've lost you at that point, and you're thinking this is all a bit complicated, the reason is because it is complicated, it is rocket science. Um, and this is a quote from Professor Don Berwick, who was part of the parliamentary review panel, which um, Simon referenced. Um, and there were two main, um, uh, I think, recommendations and comments about integrated planning within the parliamentary review. One was that much greater central direction and focus uh, was required to set that landscape and that setting uh, for health services. But that also the landscape had become particularly cluttered. Organisations were required to develop numerous plans and it wasn't quite clear how they all uh, fitted together. So I'll say a little bit about how we're addressing this and I'll apologise at this point to my colleagues in the planning community because they may have seen some of these slides before but I'll put a slightly different um, spin on them. Um, for me, our integrated medium term plans are our window on the world. They tell us exactly what the NHS in, in Wales is doing and how it's <coughs> operating uh, with its partners. So these are our uh, 16 windows on the world. We've got the 15 organisational plans and also uh, a national uh, plan for the first time. It's our shop front. It tells us exactly what our ambition is for the next three years, what organisations are hoping to achieve, how they're working with communities and how they intend to uh, deploy their, 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 um, their resources. So it's a real opportunity to sell and separate, uh, celebrate our wares, as it was. So Simon uh, uh, talked about the Healthier Wales and the transformation agenda. This is just to reiterate that we're looking to um, integrated medium term plans to describe how organisations will achieve uh, that ambition, particularly within the realm of care prevention and care closer to home, but also how organisations are going to work locally, nationally um, and regionally to, to achieve that, which loops back round to this sense of geographical narrative. There are also a number of specific actions related to integrated planning uh, within a healthier Wales. And one was this requirement uh, to simplify and streamline um, our approach, um, and also specifically uh, to provide cent greater central guidance through the development of a national, um, national plan. We were, we were required to do that uh, by December. We brought that forward and actually we launched the national plan uh, last month because we wanted it to be of value, we wanted it to be timely, and we wanted to make sure that it informed uh, the latest NHS planning round. So both of these documents are available online, they make scintillating reading, they're both quite short um, and quite accessible. Um, and what you've got are the National um, IMTP, the National Integrated um, Term Plan, it provides that central direction, it provides a retrospective review of the last planning round um, and the 15 organisational plans that are available. It tells us where we are in delivering against the key ministerial priorities, but it also importantly picks up on good practice um, and acknowledges good practice where we see <coughs> that across Wales. As you would expect though, with any review, it also picks out those areas um, and those recommendations where we want to see more progress um, across Wales. 
and then that leads quite nicely and segues into the annual planning guidance um, which will set the tone and the direction for the, uh, for the NHS organisations in their development of their next set of plans um, and that provides the, uh, the, the more detailed guidance uh, for the, the development of those plans. Just to say a little um, about the national, uh, the national plan and its findings when it was reviewing the, the uh, existing organisational plans. Um, we saw really good alignment with the Healthier Wales. Although a Healthier Wales is only a year old, we'd already seen that organisations had shifted their thinking uh, to, to, to consider how they would align uh, with the new strategic uh, context. We also saw great evidence of strengthening of regional partnership boards and greater maturity in terms of um, collaboration. We saw a very strong focus on uh, primary care and care closer to home. Um, and we also saw a great alignment with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act as well. But the areas um, that we would like to see uh, further improvement are areas such as much more maturity in commissioning, particularly collaborative commissioning where organisations uh, need to come together either on a regional basis or a national basis um, to, to deliver those greater outcomes in population health. We also looked quite critically at prevention and we saw that the NHS was taking quite a traditional approach to, uh, to prevention by and large. There were some notable ex exceptions to that, but by and large organisations were still talking about um, issues such as smoking cessation, um, obesity management, immunisations and vac vaccinations, all hugely important issues in their own right, um, but I think the challenge is to think much more broadly, uh, particularly around the wider determinants of health and the impact such as issues, um, of issues such as housing um, and employability. And those are the things that we will be looking for uh, evidence of in the next pl uh, planning round. So the framework sets out what we're looking for. Um, what I would say here is that this is our seventh round. Um, so we've got quite a foundation uh, upon which we're, we're building. There's a tempo to that to which organisations uh, are, are getting quite used to and we are strengthening and maturing uh, planning arrangements um, year on year. So we've got a strong foundation, we've got six years of experience to build on, we've got a clearer strategic uh, context now with the legislation and a healthier Wales than we've ever had um, before um, and we've got better professional um, relationships as well and a better understanding of where organisations are and what their challenges are. Um, are within that as well. So that's all led us to this point um, of, of commencing our, our seventh planning round. And we're looking for, we're very much looking forward uh, to the receiving the next set because I actually consider that to be quite a privilege to, I know some people will dread it, but I consider it quite a privilege uh, to be able to read the 15 plans uh, from across Wales and to, to understand where we are. So very Briefly, the key ministerial priorities haven't changed. They're the same as they were um, last year. Um, I'm picking up the themes that you will have heard um, throughout this morning, focusing very much on prevention, reducing health inequalities, primary care, timely access to care, and also uh, mental health. And what that looks like as a package is that quality remains the watchword. We want to see quality at the heart of um, everything that, uh, that we do. Um, uh, but with that pathway that moves from prevention through to primary care um, and through uh, efficient and effective use of, uh, of hospital services. So I've nearly <laughs> finished. This may be how you're feeling right now, and we are, we are nearly there. Um, but it was just um, really um, an analogy to say, you know, if you were going on a car journey or any big holiday, you'd have some sort of plan. You'd think about your contingencies, about, you know, is your spare tyre purpose? Have you got enough snacks? Do you know where you're going to have a comfort break? All of those sorts of things. Um, and every organisation needs, uh, needs a route map. As Simon said, the NHS has 80,000 staff. We have a, um, a combined budget of about £9 billion. We need to understand through planning how all of that uh, is to be, to be deployed. Um, and my analogy uh, would be Google Maps. Other apps are available, um, but if you think about Google Maps um, in particular, you know, it, it takes you from where you are at the moment, where you want to be um, in the future. But what it does is it pulls down a huge amount of data um, and constantly refines your route, thinking about things like uh, 
time of day, <coughs> demand in, in terms of volume and of, of traffic on the road, um, and also thinks about any unex um, unexpected circumstances and how it might need to reroute. It's agile in its approach, it's adaptive, it constantly communicates feedback back to you about how it's rerouting, and it congratulates you when you get to your destination um, as well. So for me, that's, that's what integrated planning uh, in Wales is. But it is so much more um, than a plan. It's about the journey as well as the destination. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with organisations to, to understand um, where they are with this um, at the moment and, and um, uh, how they're building relationships and developing the tools and the techniques that they need uh, to get them to their own destinations. I'll end with a couple of words around the planning programme for learning. We've put this, this is sort of the foundation that we're putting in place uh, to develop planning skills and capacity across NHS Wales initially. It is um, unashamedly health focused um, at the moment. Um, and, uh, because that was uh, where, we, where we felt that there was um, a need um, as, as a starting point. But there are four pillars which focus on uh, biannual learning events for the whole NHS planning community, workshops where we want to uh, focus on particular tools and techniques. So we're about to undertake a second round of workshops around demand and capacity planning. Um, master classes which enable us to focus on uh, particular issues so we held one um, earlier in the year around long-term planning um, and I think we're particularly interested to learn from the private sector about how it is long-term planning uh, with uh, with confidence and we'll, we've got one planned for later in November which will focus specifically on value-based healthcare the postgraduate diploma was the final piece of the jigsaw to, to fall into place um, and we're delighted that that started yesterday. But there is an ambition to expand that quite quickly and quite rapidly uh, to social care and the wider public sector because we realise that we can't uh, do this in isolation um, and that we need others um, alongside us. I shall leave it there, but uh, very happy to, uh, to take any questions. Thank you. So we've got um, 15 minutes for, <coughs> for questions. Um, a reminder that the, the questions will be recorded and we have a microphone that will go around for you. But we certainly have had a very rich overview of our strategic sense and the range and reach uh, of approaches. Would anyone like to start? <coughs> Uh, my name is Martin Kitchener, I work here at Cardiff Business School. Thank you very much indeed for two very interesting presentations. You both spoke um, to some degree about the content of A Healthier Wales. I'd like to just uh, pick up a little bit about the process of planning that led to the production of that document. You both acknowledged in your talks the, uh, the vital importance within the lost art of planning of taking on board the views both of staff groups and of uh, citizens more generally. Could you outline or say a little bit more about the mechanisms uh, through which um, the, the planning process engaged with staff groups and citizens that led to the production of Healthier Wales? I think, I think um, Healthier Wales was, I've just realised I never switched this on, I don't think. No, it's not working. Um, a Healthier Wales was quite unique, um, not just because it was the first health and social care plan for Wales, but also because there was a huge co-productive process that underpinned it. Um, so that focused specifically not so much on public engagement, more, but more um, engagement with NHS organisations um, and, and wider partners um, in what the plan could look like. So underpinned by a series of work streams and committees which informed um, its, its development. Um, and I'm not aware that we'd um, been through a process like that uh, before. I think the challenge now is thinking about how we uh, spread our reach uh, to wider communities and the public and uh, patients and carers themselves to think about the delivery, um, well not just the delivery, but the further design of uh, local and regional models for health and social care um, and having conversations with people about what's important uh, to them. So I know that there's work, there's a considerable amount of work going on, not just within Welsh Government to think about what that could look like, but also through regional partnership boards and public service boards um, as well to make sure that those uh, conversations are crafted in a very careful and, and genuine way. Hi, 
Hi, yeah, I'm Sarah Day from Practice Solutions. Uh, thank you both for your presentations, really interesting. I, I was really interested to hear about the integrated medium term plans, and I think my question follows on, or comment really that I have to make is wondering about how within those integrated medium term plans, workforce and the voice of the citizen are going to be considered and then maybe um, measured by yourselves in terms of that involvement in creating those plans. Yeah, Thanks. Abs absolutely. And this for me is where it becomes about planning rather than the product. Um, for organisations, um, it is about integrated planning, so we're expecting organisations to reach right across and down uh, within organisations to make sure that there's been in engagement um, in the development of those plans and those plans are informed on good data, intelligence um, and views as well. I think that the, the uh, relationship with workforce is, is hugely important. Where plans are, are developed well, we see um, evidence of really good synergy um, across those disciplines, particularly planning um, workforce and finance, where it's clear that the organisation um, is, is, is well connected. And I think the, the executives and those components in particular are well connected. Um, I think conversations um, with, with communities are more difficult in the context of integrated me medium term plans. It's not the most exciting subject matter, is it? You know, as, as much as I love talking about it, um, I think um, it's important there's transparency in how the plans are developed, but what's more important, I think, is, is, what, is how what's to be delivered through the plan is translated into, into conversations, whether that be about um, services for older people, diabetes or, or children. And I think we've got some great arrangements through the regional partnership boards and other mechanisms uh, to be able to do that. Just to add to that, if I may, we're really fortunate in the world that we have integrated health organisations. Mm. The, the trusts are more specialists in the nature of the three NHS trusts. But our health boards are integrated organisations and they're actually 10 years and one month old. So we have a very stable infrastructure. Uh, if I look uh, if I think about my experience with the English system, I seem to reorganise every couple of years, which is hugely distracting. So the decision was taken back in 2008 to create in 2009 those integrated population health focused organisations. So they have the opportunity, the requirement, actually the duty to be having those conversations, to be building those relationships with communities of all sorts, geographical, service focused, sectoral and partnerships, and to build those relationships so that they understand the nature, the concerns, the challenges and the opportunities that are presented in their particular parts of Wales. So it's got to be driven locally, it can't really be driven nationally, so it's building that relationship and there's some great examples across Wales where that is happening. That will produce all sorts of tensions and challenges and choices. That's the that's the joy of running a big integrated health organisation, is you have to be able to look across you know, all sorts of different definitions of community, whether it's about service community or geographical community. But it's all it all has to be built on relationships. And the OECD said when they visited Wales that we've got the right architecture in place. The parliamentary review said the same thing. So the the question is how do we maximise the benefits? of not having organisational boundaries getting in the way. There are organisational boundaries that have to be managed, particularly between health and social care, and that's where the partnership arrangements are really helpful. But we see this as being driven locally through that local relationship between organisations and the communities they serve. Okay, um, David Hanks from uh, Another and Urban Planning and another um, the first cohort for the planning development. Um, one of the real challenges that we have um, is in perhaps um, service reconfiguration to ensure long-term sustainability. Um, and I'd just be interested in, in your take as to how well we currently get the balance between on the one hand making those difficult decisions to agree the sustainability and on the other hand um, public expectation and political expediency. And I just wonder, firstly your take on how well we do that and secondly how might that balance be impacted by the future NHS Wales executive? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is always a challenging, a challenging area. And <coughs> think about life. In most aspects of life, we, we hunger for change. Technology is a good example. You know, if last year's PC is not good anymore. So there's something about how do we see change as an opportunity, not a threat, whilst also recognising the context. So. A hospital, as an example, is both an iconic building 
a provider of services and a major employer, major source of employment in a community. Hospitals that were built and designed 30, 40, 50 years ago, and you're going through some of this in your own part of Wales at the moment, need to be changed. So how do we engage the public in an open discussion that doesn't start from a premise that this is going to be difficult, so we're not going to do it, but has that open discussion and draws them into our world and our and our dilemmas, our choices. So for me, the key thing is to be open, to be transparent, and to be bold. You know, I think if you ask people questions, I think about, you know, I've, I've got, my kids are in their 20s now, but they went through the education system. I knew nothing about education, but when the local authority made decisions, or whatever it was about education matters, that impacted on my children, you know, my, question was, well, where was my opportunity to know what, to, what you're thinking about? Where's my opportunity to comment? I didn't extend that saying, you know, I, 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 the, I need to agree the outcome. But there's something really fundamental about how do we engage people in a very different way. So I'll give you one very practical example, which I think is, 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 is an excellent example of how to go about this in a different way. I'd like to have our health board in West Wales. Now that is a part of, of Wales that, where change has been on the agenda for many, many, many years and it's been quite problematic to move it from a discussion point into, into action. Um, and a large part of that was because of the way in which the debate happened. That things have moved on in how there are a lot of difficult things yet to be worked through, but the process they went through was to go to their communities and listen. They didn't go and tell their communities anything. They went to the community and said, what do you want to tell us about what matters to you in terms of your health and care? And they went through a process of engagement, not consultation, but engagement. They didn't go out with a proposition. They didn't have a hidden plan under the desk that they were seeking to get people to agree to. They went and asked communities what mattered to them about health and care in their part of Wales. And they did the same with their staff, actually. They did the same with their professional colleagues. So they generated a very open debate that l has led to a strategy that the board has supported, <coughs> that is supported by the professionals within the organisation, which have not been the case in previous attempts at change. Now, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there is a clarity about the future of healthcare delivery in West Wales. There's a lot of difficult work to do. But they created a basis for a conversation and an engaged process. And that, for me, is the key. We have to find ways of treating people as we would want to be treated, which is to have the opportunity to be involved, to have the opportunity to say what we think, to make our contribution to the debate, within a context of recognise that the decisions have to be made. So I think there are examples where we are on the path of developing a better, more open, more transparent, more engaging relationships, relationship with the public. I do think there's a lot further that we can, that we can go. And for me, the critical thing there is about building relationships. Thank you. We have another question. Thank you. My name's James Hall. I work for a charity called People and Work. We're a small third sector organisation that works around a range of projects, particularly in, in, in both Rhonda Valleys at the moment. Um, we do a number of things around wellbeing with a range of ages. Um, and thank you both for your presentations. Um, I knew a fair amount of some of the sort of legislation and, and strategy, but not so much about the planning, and that, that was really, really interesting. But I do agree with your desires for um, progress to be made on prevention. Um, we have um, engagement around uh, a project that's funded by Children Need at the moment, for instance, in, in Rhonda, helping children to become fitter and looking at their health and well-being and exercise and obesity, because it is a fact that um, children go into school um, uh, it's a sort of about 10% who are um, obese and, and, a, and about 15 to 20 coming out of primary school who are obese. Um, uh, and, and so clearly what we're doing at the moment <coughs> is not working. We live in a country with, I think, some excellent legislation, some excellent um, on a world stage strategy, um, and some excellent people running things. It's whether we do it on the ground. So for instance, a lot of people refer um, <coughs> individuals um, to people like us, third sector organisations, we're working in a, a, a big partnership, for instance, at the top around the called Welcome to Our Woods, which does things around um, outdoor learning, about outdoor exercise. We, with others, are hosting walking rugby groups, um, and we get people referred to us 
but usually not the cash. Um, and, and so I'd wonder what your view is on social prescribing and, and how that might eventually uh, flow into helping local groups develop and support people to become fitter and healthier, more engaged with their own health and well-being. Highly supportive would be, would be my starting point. I'm going to, I'll broaden out the response, if I may, which is slightly specific. <coughs> we need to be providing those opportunities for people to maximise their own uh, benefits in, in life. So I absolutely agree with that. I think the broader response I'd make is one of the challenges that <coughs> I think many organisations face, and it's unique to healthcare, is the balance between the urgent and the important. Now, there is always a risk that immediacy forces you to focus on some things, whereas actually the real gain is in investing effort, resource in the broader sense of things that have a long-term impact. Um, the, the First Minister recently um, agreed, a few months ago, agreed definition of prevention with the Wellbeing of Future Generation Commission, which actually is a very broad definition of prevention. And as Samir said in her presentation, I think sometimes we've taken a very narrow view. Replacing someone's hip is preventative. If it helps that person be mobile, socially engaged, possibly back in the work in the workplace. So it's it's not a narrow definition. We need to be very much broadening our thinking out, and we have to find that right balance between dealing with the, the immediate pressures. I, mean, I, I don't think I'm sort of betraying a, a national secret to say that our unscheduled care system is today under huge pressure. It's the same across uh, the most developed uh, NHS system and its healthcare system. So there is an immediacy about responding to those needs, but we've got to find the right balance between that and investing in the future. Uh, and I think this is the points that Samir was, was making. And it's the reason why a medium term plan is really important. So what uh, a, a sort of caricature view of NHS planning would be that we have grand statements. We want to provide high quality care for people close to home delivered by the right person when they need it. That's not a strategy. That's a, that's a sort of statement of aim. And then you have a lot of focus on what are we going to do this month, next month, this year. And the critical bit for me is the bit that sits between those two. It's your Google Maps analogy. You know, what, what, what are the steps that we want to take on that journey towards that very laudable aim of you know, right quality care and healthy communities? And it's, and it's not allowing it just to focus on what matters in the here and now, and that that can be quite challenging. But we need, that's the space that we need to be in. It's the space we're looking to our integrated health boards to be in. If we focus on this f aspect of healthy weight, for example, there's an immediate benefit for those patients, but there's also a benefit in five years' time in terms of use of resources that otherwise would have been used to treat the consequences of failing to be in the preventative space. So I absolutely agree with you. Is there more that we can do? Absolutely there is a lot more that we can do, which is why it remains one of the Minister's five key priorities. Where that balance settles is, is always a source of tension and challenge because there are so many competing demands. But we're absolutely determined not just to have that very short-term focus and not to concern about the future. And that's what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is, is all about. Just, just very, very quickly, I think we recognise that it's absolutely an area where we need to do more. We see some really good examples of good practice, like the work that you describe um, in Rhonda Um But also, I'm, I'm a fan of technology. I like Facebook and things like that. Um, and on one day on Cardiff and Vale's Facebook page, it was talking, and it, this wasn't planned, but it happened that their stories were about things like next bikes on prescription, about the work that their dietitians were doing on tackling food poverty in young people. And um, they've developed a meadow in Landoc, which attracts a certain type of bee, which makes honey, which fights superbugs. You know, and this was all in the realm of, um, uh, of, of prevention and well-being. Um, we want to see more of those examples, but we also want to see that happen in a much more strategic um, and planned way. And we have some very challenging conversations with the Future Generations Commissioner and her team about how much further and faster we need to go in that respect. So, um, <coughs> we can take one last question before we, we finish. <coughs> Hi there, my name's Louise Leach. I'm the um, Children's Physio um, and Adults with Learning Disabilities Manager in Nyron, Bevan. 
Um, my question is around staff wellbeing and kind of what's the strategic sort of, because I deal with a lot with mm. mental health issues for members of staff, um, and it's something that obviously organisationally across Wales we're seeing lots and lots of increase. Um, and what we're finding is occupational health services are absolutely inundated. Um, there needs to be a lot more sort of lower level prevention. And I just wondered what, what sort of a, is that wider strategic sort of role in the future really sort of focusing on? Yeah, absolutely. The NHS and care of people <coughs> businesses, aren't they? It doesn't, you know, we can have all the buildings we want, all the technology we want, the best business process, but if we haven't got people who feel engaged, who feel supported, and who feel constructively challenged and have opportunities to develop, then, then all of those things will, will achieve nothing. So uh, we, we have to engage with staff. It's, a bit, it's an echo of the discussion we've just mm -hmm. had, actually. How do we engage staff? Because if I think about how, how, what do I want when I, when I go to work, I want to feel supported, I want to understand my role, I want to feel connected into something, I want to understand where the organisation is trying to go, I want to be supported, I want to be constructively challenged, I want development opportunities, I want, I want to feel a part of something, and I'm sure that everyone else feels exactly the same thing, so how do we, how do we generate that? And it's not about occupational health, that's, that's an end point. It's about how we engage with staff on the journey so that, so that we you know, need occupational health services, but so that they play a part. And, you know, there is, a, in fact, I was in the Nairn Bevan yesterday talking about unscheduled care. And it was, a, it was badged as a winter pressures discussion, but actually there's no such thing as winter pressures because pressure is on all year. So the, the years where there was a, a relatively quiet period over the summer and people could catch a breath and you know, decompress a bit and then get gear up for the, for the next push, you know, that, that doesn't happen anymore. The, the pressure is there relentlessly, so we have to find ways of supporting staff. And for me it's about supporting staff, it's about engaging staff, about them helping to shape where the organisation is going, to feel a sense of ownership, so it's a co-productive approach, supported by appropriate supportive interventions of various sorts where needed because <coughs> you know, there is a continuum here. But we, that, for me the key is to engage people to, to help them feel supported in, in that way. So that's possibly a nice point at which to leave this. This is obviously a wide ranging <coughs> discussion and one that we could keep going um, on all morning. Um, I mean I think for all of us there's um, in our in our roles, but also in our capacity as users or potential users of the service, it's really lovely to hear the overview of um, the vision and, and all the work and the wide range of activities that are going into supporting that. And also that sense of the fact that conversation and engagement are so integral to that. So huge thanks um, to Simon and to Sammy this morning um, for their openness to the conversation and to you also for, for your part in it. So if we could please show our appreciation to them both. <laughs>